This is the June 10th, 2021 meeting. Notice of this meeting has been advertised in the Grand Island Independent, which is the district's designated method of giving notice of these meetings. We want those in attendance to know that copies of the Open Meetings Act are available at the entrance of the boardroom. If anyone in attendance is interested in addressing our board, you're welcome to do so. We simply request that you complete the appropriate form and turn it into us now so that you may be recognized during the public forum part of our meeting. And I know I have a few of these, so if there's anyone else that hasn't had a chance to fill theirs out, you can and then hand it to Dr. Dexter there in the yellow blazer. And these forms are also located by the entry doors of the room. Mrs. Simmons, will you please call the roll? Mrs. Hinkle. Present. Mrs. Albers. Present. Mr. Brown. Present. Mrs. Jurgens. Present. Mr. Barsinus. Yes. Mr. Hawley. Present. Ms. Wolf. Yes. Dr. Bros. Here. Mr. Holinsky. Here. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, agenda item three is our mission statement. Dr. Bros, will you please read that for us? Absolutely. Every student, every day, a success. In educating students, we teach hearts as well as minds. Student commitments. Within the school district of Grand Island, every student will be taught to read, write, and communicate effectively, solve problems, acquire and apply knowledge, and demonstrate mastery through performance to the best of the student's abilities. Every student will be treated with fairness and dignity. Every student will be honored for their unique qualities and backgrounds. Every student will experience a sense of belonging, contribution, and success. And every student will develop responsibility and show respect for others as well as oneself. All right, thank you. Agenda four is the consent agenda, which includes 4.1, the minutes from the previous month's meeting, 4.2, the claims as submitted, 4.3 bid proposals as submitted, 4.4 staff adjustments as submitted, 4.5 treasurer's report as submitted, 4.6 which are the policies including 8457 internet safety and acceptable use on final read, 2215 board membership on first read, 2311 board member vacancies on first read, 3210 superintendent qualifications, recruitment and appointment on first read. 4.7 are the contracts, agreements, and memorandums of understanding, including the project search, uh, MOU for 2021-2022, and 4.8 is the approval of the agenda as submitted. Just a minute, I gotta get back up here. This is the consent agenda as published. Would anyone like to remove any items or add any items to the consent agenda? Mrs. Albers. I motion to remove the contract for Luis Hernandez Ruiz from the addendum to the staff adjustments. This contract may be brought for approval at a later date. Also out of an abundance of caution, I hereby declare a potential conflict of interest and hereby abstain from voting on check number 76529 as part of agenda item 4.2 of the agenda materials for this meeting. I vote in favor of all other consent items. And in addition, mm -hmm. agenda item 8.7 will immediately follow the consent agenda because the pre presenter has a scheduling conflict. And I'm, otherwise, I make a recommendation to approve the consent agenda as submitted. With the changes. Right. With the changes. All right, second, Mr. Brown. Any discussion or questions? Please vote. Motion passes. All right, we will skip to agenda item 8.7 and then go back to the regular agenda. Miss, or Dr. Palmer, sorry. Oh, we're gonna skip, we're doing that now. Yeah. Thank you so much while I get hooked up here. Okay. Um, I am pleased to present um, some up updates on 
um, our JAG program and how that's been going this year. Um, actually, I'm not going to present the updates, but I have a special guest that is going to present the updates. Shara Piercy is here, and she is going to, um, this is a program that we actually, uh, this just ended our first year, and so we're going to give you some information just on um, what, what, what took place and um, what's to come in the future. So I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you talk about it. All right. And I'll put you on present if that will help. Here we go. Okay. I'm not on the right slide, so... All right, hello everybody. I'm Shara Piercy. I'm the JAG Career Specialist. Um, and as Dr. Palmer just said, this was our first year. It was pretty amazing. It was my first year with JAG as well. So it's, it's been a great experience all the way around between um, the students, the staff, um, Grand Island Senior High as a whole, Grand Island Public. So I just wanna thank you guys all for including JAG and putting it there, putting it in senior high because it's truly a great program. So I'm just going to go over a little bit really quick because they wanted us to be quick. Um, JAG goes so much with Grand Island Public School with voice and choice. That's a huge part of what our program does. The two biggest places you're going to see that is probably in our PBLs, which is project-based learning, if you're not familiar with that, and in our program of work, which we will we do at the beginning of very early in the year. The program of work is done through our career association. There's, there's so many layers to JAG that I'm going to try not to have you confused in this short amount of time. So we have a career association. It's a club that all students are a part of. Um, some don't get in the, involved as others, just like any other club, but all JAG students are a part of the Career Association. We pick officers from a president to vice presidents for different areas and a secretary. And at the beginning of the year, we did an in initiation and installation. So the picture I have up is our, in our first ever initiation and installation, or we call it I&I &I for short little easier. Um, we do trainings and competitions. We were part of the National Student Leadership Association. Um, this last year, we did not do any of the, those competitions because we didn't have a lot of time to get ready and we were still kind of feeling our way around. But we did have a career development conference this last spring and we had a lot of fun with that. We had a few competitors. I had some students compete in public speaking. I had some students compete in um, a portfolio that we call a career exploratory binder and a couple other events. And we actually, um, McKenna, who I will introduce in a little bit, actually won second place for the portfolio. So it was, it was pretty amazing. So part of what we do, part of uh, JAG stands for Jobs for American Graduates. And it's about getting students on their feet and ready for life after graduation. So we do a lot of career preparation um, from communication skills, cover letters, resumes, um, career exploratory notebook like I had talked about. It's kind of a portfolio. Um, this next year we're also going to do a, a virtual portfolio um, we do what to wear, job expectations, just um, a lot of different things that students don't realize they need to know when they step out those doors. Some things we have coming up this year is some mock interviews. We were never able to get that done this last year, so mock interviews are part of the plan. Um, and then going through the process of changing a job, just because that's really important to know how to leave a job properly. We work on social skills, so we, we, this is a game of students playing pit, which some of you may have heard. Um, it's kind of working with money and stuff like that, but it's this trading cards, and they're all trying to get the same amount, but this is youth entrepreneurship style, so it's through a program that we've been using in the classroom that teach, teaches entrepreneurship skills. The other picture is right after our I and I, we had a celebration day and um, played games and just really, fo really focused on what we want to do, how we want to accomplish the rest of the year. 
Team building skills is also a big part of the program. So these are two different tower things. Most of you have probably heard of the Marshmallow Tower Challenge. That was a lot of fun. A lot of students had a, lot, had a blast with that. The other one was building the tallest, most beautiful tower with just weird items. And the whole idea with that one was to get them. They had very limited items. And so it was to see if the groups would trade with each other and kind of learn how to use the free market that way. We work on civic awareness. I just realized that I used this picture twice and I probably should have used the one with the mayor, <laughs> not the mayor, with the governor. So we went um, to, we had our, excuse me, I'm just losing my words for a minute. We had a legislative day late in the year and were invited to the governor's mansion in Lincoln. We um, went there for a barbecue in the backyard. It was pretty amazing. We also, went through the Capitol and had a little tour. We talked to um, Senator Aguilar for a little bit. And so this, it was just a really great experience for the students to see that at a little older age in their life. Because when you're in fourth grade, you see one thing, but as a junior or senior, it's a totally different perspective. And the student I have pictured here, he was one of my shyest students at the beginning of the year. And he was, he was approaching people on his own at this point. So um, that was pretty amazing to watch that happen. So he was talking to um, one of the ladies that works for the Department of Labor, which is one of our big funding sources. So it was pretty awesome. We also do service learning. We don't just want them to have a job or go to college. We want them to be valuable members to society in all ways. So one thing we did um, for a service learning project was um, working on the environment. We actually had people talk to the classroom about some environmental issues. We ended the program, or we ended that service learning project with cleaning up part of 281. And you know, the students actually had a lot of fun doing that. So they were, they were razzing each other and kind of competing, seeing who can fill up the bags the fastest. So it was a really neat experience and teaching them that work can be fun and doing for other people. And I think it really opened their eyes too to see how, how much litter there is and how much we could do for the environment. So I really look forward to what we have Coming next year, I'm not really completely sure what we're going to do. We also were invo involved in a toy drive for Toys for Tots. We we're hoping to do a little more with that this year than what we did. And we're going to be meeting at um, Central Nebraska Humane Society next week as a summer meetup and going to do a tour there and play with some of the dogs and find out a little more about some of the needs in that area. All right, so a big thing in JAG is teaching the students to represent. So one of these pictures is them preparing, their, preparing posters for our rush week when we are trying to advertise JAG and get more students. And the next picture is my other class that I had done the cleanup with on 281. And speaking of representing, I have, like I said, McKenna won that award. This is McKenna Heitman, and she was our first ever Career Association member, or president. So I'm gonna let her share a little bit about JAG. All right, hi everyone. As she said, my name is McKenna Heitman. I was the current president. Um, I just recently graduated from Grand Island Senior High. Um, and JAG definitely did help me solidify my future. Um, I completed a four, or four, 380 on my career path. Um, I am now going to Missouri for college to, career, to pursue a career that I'm very excited for. And this, this JAG Association really helped me with that, leadership-wise, skills-wise, you know, communication-wise. And I really do hope that it helps everyone else in the future, too. So I can't wait to come back and see what JAG has done for everyone else, so. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> Well, I hope I didn't confuse everybody. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so for much. coming and sharing that with us tonight. It's very interesting to see everything that you do, even in a year like this. It was very cool to see, so we appreciate it. Ms. Yes. Wolf. 
I just had a quick question on what the career you're interesting or interested in pursuing. So I wanted to be a nurse, but due to some surgeries that I had and everything, that was my case. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and then I shadowed at CHI um, for one of the AMS capstone classes here at Gish. And I now am going to be majoring in physical therapy and sports medicine for children. So good for you. Thank That's you. awesome. Good job. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so we will move to agenda five, which is item five, sorry, which is the pre-K early learning tool of the mind, implementing our new instructional resource, Dr. Palmer. Yes. And so while you're p p pulling up that video, um, Amy Richards has, is, has just done an amazing job uh, preparing our preschoolers uh, for kindergarten, really working hard on the curriculum. And she really wanted you just to kind of see what tools of the mind looks and sounds like and what our preschoolers are experiencing. I know she's watching tonight, so um, definitely want to do a little shout out for her and our, our early learning uh, team as well. Our, P our PK uh, teachers are phenomenal. We're really excited about what's to come for our preschoolers moving forward. Okay, here we go. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk and share our campus highlights with the board today. We are really excited to share with you how implementation of tools of the mind has been going. We started implementing this new instructional resource this year with full implementation next year. But I have been so excited to see our teachers embrace these new strategies and most importantly to see our students thrive from having these learning experiences. But much more interesting than hearing me talk about this, we wanted the opportunity to show you just what we've been up to with tools of the mind. One area we'd like to highlight is message of the day. As we work to integrate our literacy content in a meaningful and engaging way for students. example of one student who is using lines to represent words, also including his name as well as the sounds that he hears in each word. Cool. Graphics practice is another area we're focusing on with students using those fine motor skills along with self-regulation. Now we're going to see the very beginning stages when students were just learning how to work together to learn. Now all of us, we want to put each of those farm animals on the cart. 
Next, you'll see an example of our buddy reading where students are using lip cards to show that they're the speaker or the reader and ear cards to show that they're the listener. I'm most excited about what our data is saying about this new approach for us. Looking at our students from this year, we've highlighted three objectives that relate to early reading or early literacy. For the first one, notices and discriminates discrete units of sound. We're seeing that 85% of our students are meeting expectation, expectations and additional 10 are exceeding those expectations. In identifying and naming letters, 49% of our students are meeting expectations and an additional 30% are exceeding those expectations. And in identifying letter sound correspondence, 81% of our students are meeting expectations with an additional almost 9% exceeding uh, those expectations. And 97% of our students met growth expectations for the year in these areas. So overall, we're so excited about the investment that Grand Island Public Schools has made in our new curricular resource, and we can't wait for next year to fully implement. Thank you. Well, that's pretty amazing that that's preschool. All right. So now we're going to move to agenda item six, which is the awards for, or the student recognition for Arter Awards. Miss LaBreeze, oh my goodness, couldn't say any of that, right? Good evening. So I have the honor tonight, um, I'm Charity LaBree, I'm the fine art, current fine arts director, and I have the honor of recognizing two of our students. We had 18 students that received either a state level or a national level art award, which is just phenomenal. Um, and we also have an art camp going on this week at Hastings College. Um, not sponsored by us, but we have several students attending. So tonight we have two students that we'd like to honor. Um, Ebony Chagru received a, a, an award for a collage. And so we'll welcome Ebony. And then the second person we'd like to honor this evening is Tia Broadwell. She received two awards. One was for a charcoal and one was for an oil painting. So she's receiving an award tonight as well <laughs> yes and we'll send those to the yes i was waiting for you guys <laughs> All right, so we will move to agenda item seven, public forum. Each individual addressing the board will be allowed three minutes tonight. Um, we will, just so everyone knows who's speaking, we will not engage in dialogue with um, you here as a board. And let's see here. I will, as board president, ask the superintendent to identify staff to follow up on any information if necessary see here I think that's really and just a reminder that um, well I think we're fine we'll, we'll go forward so um, our first speaker is Sherry Jones and Sherry if you want to come forward and then um, give your name and address and then explain what you want to speak on tonight yes Sherry Jones 4048 Palace Drive here in Grand Island 
And I'm gonna be speaking about, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I guess. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm here to share my thoughts and concerns about regarding the health standards being proposed by the State Board of Education, in particular the standards of the human growth and development strand. Although these proposed standards are current, currently in draft form, I believe it would be prudent of you to study the original 60-page document as individuals, as well as, boy, I'm not used to having a mask on. Um, I probably can't take it off to speak. Do I need to leave it on? We prefer to leave it on. Okay. Okay. I believe it would be prudent of you to study the original 60-page document as individuals as well as a collective body. Um, and perhaps you have already done so. But I believe your constituents will be inquiring where you stand. I read the document, completed the online survey, emailed the State Board of Education president, and have attended two of the last three school board meetings. We're both opposing and supporting, um, though we're, we're both those opposing and supporting the standards have spoken. Those speaking against the standards have greatly outnumbered those in support. Um, will the second draft be modified in response to the majority's concerns? I do not know. However, I predict if these proposed standards are not significantly modified, the integrity of Nebraska's Board of Education will be in question and there will be a great public outcry. Additionally, if local school boards adopt unmodified standards, it could result in students being withdrawn from their public school, I fear, um, choosing to be homeschooled or to send their children to a private or parochial school. That is how big of a deal I believe these standards are. What are some possible outcomes if these proposed human growth and development standards are adopted? In my opinion, I believe they will, and I would just share six of my, um, what I believe will be the outcomes. We will be confusing children. We'll be stealing their innocence, for they will be hearing and seeing things they ought not to be exposed to. We'll lead children to question their birth sex may lead children to make decisions which they may come to regret, such as the taking of hormone blockers for those deciding to transgender. Men, they may lead children to make behavior choices which present health risks, both emotional and physical ones. And I believe it would undermine parental decision making. During the last 14 years of my 35 year employment with the Grand Island Public School, I was an elementary school counselor, and I taught personal safety and, and, um, and growth and development standards. If these proposed health standards would have been in effect during my tenure, I could not in good conscience have taught the content. And I just, in closing, I wanna say that um, I plan to, I, I wanna announce my intention of running for the State Board of Education, District 6, and I will be a conservative voice protecting the hearts and the minds of our children. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our second speaker is Spencer Prentice. He's got one. He's got big oh, aim. Can you hear me? Okay. So my name and address. Or uh, my name and uh, my bad. My name and address. Do you want me to start off with my name and my we, address? We have that information, Spencer, so uh, you can you can go ahead with your remarks. Okay. Okay. You say you care about the children. Do you only care, um, then why do you force them to wear a mask 
for eight hours a day throughout the whole 2020 school year. According to testing done by Pfizer and in collaboration with BioNTech, um, children are less likely than adults to have um, serious cases of COVID-19. So if you do follow the mask policy, other schools are implementing, there are no benefits to wearing a mask or getting the vaccine. Um, re reducing the oxygen supply and manipulating them into getting vaccines that are still under clinical trials. That is not what I consider in their best, best interest for this coming year. COVID for this coming year. COVID-19 only has a 1% mortality rate. Come on, think of that, 1%. So I'd like to ask you why you are putting vaccine clinics in a lot of elementary schools around Grand Island. The curriculum you will probably adopt, come on, don't get me wrong, you will adopt if they pass are totally inappropriate and uncalled for and need to be opposed. Um, what else do you expect from a group that has never, has been screwing us over the city they represent and say you care about. If these policies do pass and, and you adopt them, I will set up petitions to remove each and one of, each and every one of you from office. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's still on. Thank you. All right, our, our ne next speaker is Kathy Rawl. If you just want to state your name and address and what you will be speaking on. I'm Kathy Rawl, and my address is 109 Lakeview Circle, Apartment 9, Grand Island. And basically, I want to talk about the health standards for the kids, too. I'm appalled. I did get a um, proposal, the first draft, and when you read it, it looks pretty good. But I think it's pretty sugar-coated when it comes to the sex ed part. Um, some of the things, well, first I need to say, too, I'm a grandma, and I'm a great-grandma, and I have kids in school, and I'm really concerned. I, I know my daughter will pull her son out of school. She's already said that. And how she will homeschool him, I don't know, because they need two incomes. And I'm not smart enough to homeschool him. <laughs> but, um, and the other one, they'll just be pulled out of school. I don't know where they'll go. I did talk to a teacher who actually said, um, no, I don't want you to know who she is. She's making some changes is what she's doing with her kids too. And she doesn't want to teach this stuff at all. And she's feels what's going to happen is you're going to lose good Christian teachers 
and then you're gonna get in all liberal teachers because that's what there's gonna be left. And they're gonna teach bad things to our kids. We have um, learned a lot of things from meetings and other people who have studied for two years on this. And there's a thing on Facebook that says, you know, little kids don't need to decide if they're a boy or a girl. A little boy needs a truck and a sandbox and a mud pile. He doesn't need to be trying to decide that at five years old. And then if he says, oh, I think I want to be a girl, they're going to give him hormone blockers. And once the, my understanding is, is once the hormone blockers are started, you can't go back. So my concern is for all my, all the kids, not just my grandkids or my great grandchild, but I've got another great grandchild coming too. And, and if this goes down the pike, which I hope it doesn't, and I've heard it will go before the legislature if it gets that far, I just pray it doesn't. I guess I just ask if, if you believe in prayer, ask God what He wants you to do. Not what the school board wants you to do. We heard them last Friday, and it was pretty wild. Um, they didn't let everyone speak that they were going to let speak. There's a lot of stuff going on with them. But just think about our kids and what's, what's really right. Does a four- or five-year-old little boy or girl decide if they're a boy or a girl? And are they happy with what's put on their birth certificate? Um, that's craziness. My great-grandson will be born in July, and he will be a boy. And nobody will change his parents' mind. So anyway, that's all. I don't have any big statistics or anything, just from my heart. That Oh, the, other, the last thing I do want to ask, though, is have you all gotten a copy of this, and have you all read it? Because I don't know if everybody's gotten it. I don't know if everybody's read it. As I mentioned, we don't engage. I know. As, but afterwards, I'll talk about it. But your time is My up. time's up? Yeah. So. But that's the first thing I was supposed to talk about. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Our next speech, speaker is Marjorie Creason. Did I say that correct? Yes. Chris, if you want to come forward and, again, state your name and address and what you would like to speak on. Marge Creason, 4310 Blah Belt Road, Grand Island, Nebraska. Okay. I would like to um, visit about CRT, critical race theory, and uh, CSE, which is comprehensive sexuality um, education. Um, I'm a mother, a grandmother, and a grand, uh, great-grandmother. I'm also a retired um, social worker after 27 years with Health and Human Services. That was a long 27 years. Uh, thank you for allowing me time to um, talk about my grave concerns as to CRT and CSE. I have reviewed and heard lots of information on both. I am beyond shock as to the possibility of this being taught to America's most precious resource, our children. This will be of all ages and at all levels of our educational system. CRT and CSE, it will be poisoning our children's minds. This is indoctrination. This CRT, CSE curriculum, I consider to be child abuse, child enticement, and porn. I have seen some of the books that is part of the curriculum. I do not want my tax dollars paying for this curriculum. It is my opinion that CRT, CSE is Marxist. If I were to believe in CRT and CSE, I would consider myself a racist. All of our children are gifts from God, and they need to be taught to be critical thinkers. They need to be worried about reading, math, science, and civics. I hope that parents take uh, opportunity to access the Public Records Act to stay informed. Least we forget, I am a highly overtaxed taxpayer Therefore, parents and myself are paying for these teachers' salaries. I do not want my hard-earned tax dollars go to teaching our children to hate themselves, to hate each other, to hate America, and to hate police. CRT and CSE is a war on our most vulnerable, and that is our children. 
we must protect our children. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Valerie Chamelka. Yeah, there you are. I couldn't see you back there. Um, before I start, um, I just wanted to tell you I'm here for Michelle Carter. Michelle's daughter had a stroke on Sunday. Aww. And I should have said this is the end. She's on her way home right now, and she'll be on hospice. And um, she'll be at home on hospice. They're on the way home right now. So, well, thank you for, um, I'm thank reading, you for from, reading this. Michelle sent me the statement to read, and I said I would come read it for you. Thank so, you. I'm Valerie Kamoka, 1717 Gretchen Avenue. I'm reading the statement for GIA, oh, sorry, I already said that. On behalf of over 500 certified and classified Grand Island Education Associate members, I would like to express our concern about eliminating class sections at many elementary schools. It is crucial to know it's not just about the numbers. We recognize the school district is potentially or currently facing financial challenges. Therefore, attrition and the transition from this year to a pandemic was used as cost-saving measure. We appreciate the use of current staff to fill vacancies that no reduction in force notices had to be issued. Our concern lies in the fact that classrooms are not about numbers. We can continue to see ex escalations in the number of severity of behaviors, especially when classrooms reach numbers over 22 students. Because of the freeze of adding grade level sections, we are concerned about the quality of instruction we will be offering our students when we have class sizes averaging 25 students. Many of our Title I schools will have large numbers of students. However, again, it's not just about the numbers. With a classroom of 25 students, a large number of them are special education and English language students. For example, if this freeze is not lifted, Jefferson Elementary fifth grade would have 56 students split into two sections, resulting in 28 per classroom. Of those 56 students, 17 are special education service students and also English language learners. In the past, the importance of splitting these classes into three sections was recognized because student needs and behaviors. Another example is Dodge Elementary. The first and fifth grade classrooms are projected to have 22 students each. Both of these students, groups of students have major behavior concerns. First grade classrooms have half of their students in response to intervention from one or more subjects. In fifth grade, each teacher has two identified behavior students and at least one third of the class is RTI. One third are special education. How are students receiving our best in these situations? Next year at Start, it's projected that fourth grade has 58 students divided in two sections, having a class size of 29 students. At Engelman Elementary, all of their classes, four sections, have an average of 25 students at each grade level. We encourage the district to provide a counselor and social worker and specialist at each building. Specialists were just told at three o'clock today that they all have two schools except Ingram and Shoemaker, keeping us from providing the needs we need to those students. The GIA also encourages the district to look at using incoming federal funds from ESSER three to hire staff to fill some of these classroom gaps. And where buildings can accommodate adding another section to improve student learning and outcomes, we strongly encourage the district to move forward with those efforts. Our teachers and staff work hard and will continue to do what is best for students, but our students cannot get the best in these untenable situations. Thank you. Thank you. And please let Michelle know we're thanking ever. I will. I'm taking Betty All right. And um, our final speaker is Patricia Leg. Did I say that right? Hi, my name is Patricia Legg. My address is 8637 South Locust Street. That's in Donovan, Nebraska. Thank you for allowing me time to ask several questions of the board regarding the proposed health standards, namely the human growth and development standards. I am a mother, grandmother, and involved citizen. I am wanting to learn and grow in my knowledge of what's going on around me, this being my first time at a school board meeting. As living in, in Hall County, I thought I would take this opportunity to engage your thoughts. Number one, I would be interested as to what you are hearing from your public, whether parents, grandparents, or concerned citizens regarding draft one of the proposed health standards. Number two, as a concerned citizen, I have attended two of the three Department of Education meetings in Nebraska and have observed 70 to 90 percent 95% in opposition to these proposed health standards, uh, namely the human growth and development standards. Is this in line with the interest shown to this uh, superintendent and or board of education? 
So if we're seeing this much opposition at our State Board of Education meetings, what are you hearing, what are you seeing? And we as a population would like to hear that. Number three, as I observe Grand Island Public Schools to be an inclusive and engaging institution, I am wondering whether you are holding parent information meetings to ensure families are also informed of what is in the proposed health standards. We would not want families to be left out in their understanding when we are so inclusive of our children. Number four, has the superintendent and our board shared their stance regarding the pros, proposed health standard to the Grand Island uh, Public Schools through your messaging system? If so, what was shared? I am aware of a surrounding school having shared their stance as informed, as informed by a parent in their community, and I just wonder how many parents or grandparents or who all knows about the uh, proposed health standards, especially this human growth and development standard. And number five, are you aware of when the second draft of the standards will be shared with the public? I did have an email received today, and I was told that the second standards, set of standards will not be even communicated until the fall of this year. And so I enlist you to, uh, I'm, I'm question and I wonder how well you have read the health standards and what will your stance be um, as we continue to find out what the uh, second draft, draft of the standards will be shared only in the fall. For that, I am interested in your responses, and thank you for listening. All right, thank you. All right, so um, just quickly for on the board's behalf, um, with regards to the GIEA statement, uh, I'll have I'll ask Dr. Grover to um, work back with her cabinet on that and do a response to the GIEA. Um, with regards to I'll go first to the, the mask and vaccines, um, would just share that we continue to evaluate our policies. We have the reimagine plan and we just recently today announced some additional changes for summer school and we'll continue to work through those. Uh, part of the requirements of receiving the COVID relief money from the federal government is that we put a plan together uh, this summer and so the administration team is already working on that so that will be communicated to help parents and families uh, when that is complete. Uh, then with regards to the health standards and the critical race theory, I'll just put those all together uh, since it's regarding curriculum and education. With regards, to, uh, we have not um, made a formal statement or taken a formal uh, stance on the proposed from NDE and the reason why is because we do know that they're proposed and that they're, they're, they need to do their work first, collect the feedback, um, and then so then once it gets to final drafts is when we would review it and determine whether or not it's something uh, in that final format that Grand Island Public Schools would want to implement. Uh, it is not required for us to implement what NDE uh, finally lands on. Uh, we have read it as school board members. We have received some emails um, about it as well. Uh, but again, as I said, we're not taking a formal stance on it just because we know it's too early and we know things are going to change. We're going to, that's what uh, this process that the NDE is going through with this curriculum is similar to all other curriculum adoptions as well. Um, and so we'll continue to let that process go forward as needed. So I think that's where we're at. And we appreciate everybody's time to come here and speak to us. We know that takes a lot of time and effort um, and you have other uh, responsibilities as well in your life and so we appreciate it and so thank you all right we will move forward with our agenda items and moving into agenda item 8.1 the GIPS foundation check presentation legacy funds mrs. Skullberg oh there she is she's outside okay All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm Tracy Skalberg with the Grand Public Schools Foundation. And um, I am here today with our board president, Vicki Duell. Um, we're going to give you an update on the legacy funds of the foundation. And just to kind of give you an idea, what, what are legacy funds? 
Um, oftentimes at the GIPS Foundation, we talk about legacy funds, and sometimes we refer to them as our, as our quiet funds. Um, a legacy fund is just really a fund set up with guidelines for a specific purpose. Um, we call all funds that are not necessarily scholarships legacy funds, but generally they are grant-making funds. Um, these funds are sometimes given in honor or in memory of someone, and um, they all have one thing in common, and they make grants that have a powerful impact on our students each year. So in some cases, these grants are individual grants, so we don't get to celebrate them as much as we might celebrate, say, a classroom grant. But the overall effect is a big contribution to the ability of the district to provide both equity and access for students. Um, so that every student every day can be a success. So recently we featured some of these funds on the Heartbeat video with Dr. Grover, and I hope you had the opportunity to watch that, had all the feels in it. Um, I didn't cry while filming it, but I did cry when I watched it. So, um, but really that is our why on those legacy funds, and so I um, hope you had the opportunity to see it. So since September 1, the foundation has spent um, $92,602 on these types of grants, and we wanted to tell them, tell you about them in a public and kind of aggregate way. Um, so Vicki Duell, our board president, is gonna tell you kind of what things we've, what kinds of things we've funded and how the magic happens. So Vicki. Thanks, Tracy. <clears throat> I have the um, unique privilege of serving on a couple of these grant making committees. And the process works like this. The committee receives a grant request and then each committee has um, a review board. So um, I'll speak to the Southern Committee because um, the Bill and B. Southern Endowed Fund is one of the grant committees that I'm on. We get the um, request and we have a committee made up of about seven retired um, Walnut staff members, not just teachers, but staff members. We review the request, do a little bit of fact finding if we're not sure about all of the request. And then sometimes there's a question about, does this fit in with the district philosophy? Does this fit in with what the district is doing? And if that's the case, we check that out, make a decision and then um, let the foundation know and the person who applied for the grant know that yes, it's been received or accepted and yes, it's been funded or you have to tweak it a little bit or no, it hasn't been funded and this is why. Um, here's some examples. The foundation is the philanthropic um, partner for, the GIP, for GIPS and processes all gro um, grants into the district and then distributes them. Now Tracy said 92,000 and you can say, that's a lot of money. I wanna say that's a lot of money and the foundation has four staff members, 2.8 FTEs, they do a lot of work. So that's not just something that takes place easily. Um, the equation used for the, um, the equation that we've used for all of this and for like the food for thought program and the outreach program were a, a total of $8,200 were spent this year. On the Wallback Student Kindness Fund, this year the district spent, or the foundation spent $8,988.77. We paid for things like cap and gowns fees, gas for medical appointments in Lincoln and Omaha, um, show choir funds, clothing, uh, winter clothing, winter coats, band fees, tennis shoes, uniform cleaning fees, work clothes, glasses, dentist, and transportation. Um, the Stelk Hal Fund has paid, we paid out $600 to pay for high ability learner summer camps for students. Uh, the COVID-19 emergency fund, which is something new this year, we've paid $18,607.41. We've covered things like transportation, heat, um, rent, utilities, Counseling, and this is for not only students, but also for staff members, clothing, and, and uh, medical bills. The Southern Endowed Fund, um, so far this year, we've spent um, $871.23. We paid dental fees and um, sports bras and summer school shirts. Um, we'll, this is just the kind of the tip of the iceberg. This is, um, we know there'll be many more investments coming this summer. 
And um, we want to point out this money is, that's been spent has been just for nine months from September through May. I like to say to people when they say, what are, the, um, don't, what are these endowed funds, donor funds, legacy funds um, like, what do they do? They level the playing field. Every night when you have a board meeting, you read every student every day is success. That isn't easy for all students. For some families, I can pay for the dental appointment. I can pay to, to buy the gas to get my kid to Omaha for a doctor's appointment. That's not the case for everybody. So these funds help make that possible. Um, Tracy has a check to give you. Yeah. I have the check. <laughs> I have a check. Oh, do I wish this was real. <laughs> $92,602.06 for legacy funds that the foundation has spent this year to make sure that every student every day is a success in the Grand Island Public Schools. We like those and appreciate. <laughs> we appreciate the big checks and all the work that goes into making that happen. So thank you very much. And I just want to add, um, you know, um, Vic talked about the leg or the um, COVID-19 emergency fund, and that number was about 18,000. We've actually committed um, about another 20,000 just in mental health fees that are going to be coming due this summer. So, it really was the right fund at the right time, and um, we're we're just glad to be able to be of help. So, yes. Are there any questions for us? Anybody have any questions? No, but again, thank you. Yeah, yeah, huge thank you. So you're welcome. Let's give them another round. <laughs>Good evening, Board of Education and Superintendent Grover. It is our honor to present a program to you that I have some familiarity with, and it's called the Harvard Strategic Data Project. It's something that uh, really can leverage a lot of the changes that we are planning for the next two and the next four years, and it's something that can add a lot of strength as well as a lot of national scholarship and backing. Um, and really increase our capacity for the long-range uh, future after that as well. And uh, I will add this is an info item for tonight. We plan to come back next month and present this as, a, as an action item for the board's consideration. I think Dr. Dahl was being modest when he said he had a little bit of familiarity with the Harvard Strategic Data Project. Um, he, is a, he is a data fellow himself, and so as we go through this this evening, um, keep that in mind. I think he's just being kind and letting me be involved, but, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we'll, we'll be in definitely good hands. So what is the Harvard Strategic Data Project? It's a, it's a network of, of over 200 fellows from dozens of school districts, state boards of ed, uh, uh, state education agencies, and a variety of, of other education partners. And, and all of this is put together um, by Harvard as an outreach program to help build capacity uh, to equitably increase high school graduation and positive college enrollment. So everything that GIPS is working towards in a number of different facets, this is, this is part of that conversation. Um, and they're trying to help reach and help elevate um, local education agencies and school districts to, to support the work that they're doing with, uh, with the data that's reliable, actionable, and accurate to, to, for decision making. So um, what is the, you know, the schedule? It's, a, it's actually a two-year program, and, and what you do is you, you sign up, you actually go through an application process, and during that process, um, they interview you, they interview 
um, your supervisors, they talk about what your plans are for the, the work that you're going to be doing over the next two years. Um, but just to read a quote that, that comes from them is the two-year program that strengthens the capacity of educational agencies to use data for improvement. They train data strategists to advance critical analytic initiatives, uncover valuable insights, and build strong data culture in partner organizations. So what's the, the two years look like? It's really broken into two sections. One's um, entry level, and it's not all just about data. Um, the person that we're working with um, in the organization, Mr. Larson, pretty much knows everything there is to know about the data that we have in the organization. What this does is goes beyond that, and it helps through um, a number of different ways to help grow um, the skill set that Pat has, um, the support network that Pat would have, as well as the, you know, our organization's trust and faith in the process to give us the outcomes that we're looking for. Year one, they're gonna look at data governance and management. We're gonna get into policy leadership um, surrounding uh, data. Statistical programming, data visualization and communication, as well as, as change management. So all of, all of those things are, are step one. And if you look at year two, there's a capstone project. That project actually begins well before you even start the program. You know, we've been working through that for um, a while now, and I think Dr. Dahl will talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but the, the capstone project is really what you sell to the Harvard SDP, and then they, that, that's, that's what gets them interested in having you come on board, and, and so, we'll, like I said, go into that in a minute, but you, you further the things that you worked on in the first year. So, um, predictive analytics, um, past, you know, descriptive in, in year one, experimental and quasi-experimental designs. Again, dashboarding and advanced visualization, so extending that work that's done in year one into year two. And then how do you sustain the change that you work through the, the change management process in year one? So what does it mean um, to join us, uh, SDP? It would be part of the nationwide movement in innovation and access uh, by a fellow to extensive data training and to national experts. The biggest part of this is the network that you're building. You'll be assigned a faculty advisor from Harvard, and so they will be right there um, that you can out, outreach to at any given time during the two years and, and beyond. Um, but you'll also be in a cohort with, you know, between 50 and 60 other people that are in your situation that are being sponsored, fostered through the program um, at the same time. There, there's a, a couple different ways to do it. Um, some organizations will actually uh, go out and seek Harvard to send someone over and you actually employ them for two years and they go through this process with you and the organization. In our case, we have the talent in-house and we want to we want to grow and, and foster that because we see a value in that bringing, um, bringing that uh, growth back to GIPS for the years to come um, because I certainly don't expect Mr. Larson to go anywhere. <laughs> He's been a great asset to the organization. He's been with us for nine years and he's done tremendous things. One of the things that we're really excited about, and, and I'll show this video here in just a second, is that um, Pat has some skills that are actually on the precipice of a change in the way um, organizations and, and school districts and, and state agencies look at data and equity data. And that is, his background is in GIS, and he's been doing that work a long time before he came on with Grand Island Public Schools. And so having the ability to do the spatial data relationships in, in the GIS world, the demographic world, will really be a benefit. And it's something that while we were having the conversations with Harvard about this, they, they, they got excited because they've, they're seeing this shift as well. And so having the skill set in here is a critical component to being, uh, being successful and being on the cutting edge of where, um, where SDP uh, fellows will be going. So with that, we, I checked on project, I was away, and um, when I came back, um, she presented this amazing thing to me, and I said, wow, <laughs> this is 
awesome. Um, I think that was actually my first words was, this is awesome. Because what it did was it really started to take the, the discussion away from how many students were proficient um, and having some relationship between that and their being successful to how many students are on track to graduate in the right amount of time. How many students are on track to go to college? How do we know if students um, will be successful in college? How, how soon can we help to maybe change their trajectory? I shared this finding with district leadership and it immediately sparked some questions and dialogue about what was going on in Elizabeth, um, where our students were struggling with, and particularly which courses um, they were struggling with the most. I found that over 50% of the students who were off track had failed one of five subjects. The most common subject um, was environmental science and the second most common, surprisingly, was physical education. We found that students were receiving an F if they did not have the PE uniform that day. This was a district policy that was really impacting um, our students' future success and we decided to change it immediately. Students are now allowed to complete content appropriate coursework on their iPads if they do not have the school uniform. Elizabeth said, we now know that there's something that we can change. And we think that if we make this little change, whether it's the, the policy changes, a curriculum change, that we think that, that making that shift right now will have an immediate impact on the success of our students. Um, and so we changed it. So that was just one example. Um, if you'll notice kind of woven in there though, it's not just about having the data, right? It's about knowing what you're looking for and looking beyond what people might even expect to look for. And so that's a lot of what, of what this program brings to the organization. Pat's excellent with data today, but it's about giving him that vision and that support to help identify those patterns and things that maybe need to be brought up and brought to the, the attention of the folks that are gonna help make decisions as simple as that to have high impact on the organization. And, and graduation rates. And with that, Dr. Dahl. Thank you. I want to continue with, uh, while you're thinking about that, two quotes from Harvard uh, from the Strategic Data Project. They have two fundamental premises that define what the, what the Strategic Data Project is for, what it does. The first is they say that policy and management decisions can influence schools and teachers in their ability to improve student achievement. So policy and management decisions. Second, they say valid and reliable data analysis significantly improves the quality of decision making. So it's kind of a, a circle. Get better data, get better, better decision making, get better policy, come back. So you see a, a, a very well-known well map here. And uh, what we're going to propose to you next month as an action item is that there is a newly planted circle um, in the near center of uh, Nebraska which would represent the first Nebraska Harvard Fellow. And uh, I want to uh, give you some context for this. So in terms of other organizations, there are more than 57 districts that uh, we would be a part of that have gone through the Strategic Data Project, as well as a number of national organizations. There are some, a small number of international education organizations that go through the Data Project. But again, as, as Corey was saying before, it's 50 to 60 fellows working together on common projects. And as we were talking about GIS in our, in our most recent call with Strategic Data Project, they were asking us about some kind of what are some extra areas that we could be thinking about. And uh, they said, oh, well, we've got two other folks that are going to be fellows that are also have GIS as their background and experience. And they just, the conversation just lit up. They were like seeing that they could connect people with other people who are like-minded and help extend things. So uh, I think we've kind of said this in the, in the first slide, but I want to emphasize the second point about a 100% focus towards equity. The strategic data project, if it's done correctly, and I, I come from a, a state agency that did it correctly, it didn't take away from the job that I had, including all the responsibilities that I had, because my, my responsibilities were woven into what I did for my capstone project. And what I did, each time I went to Harvard, 
uh, the, the professional development events, I might bring back something that I could share with my team. Or I might go there with a question from my team to get answers. But it was always, we just always connected it to the work. And so it wasn't a, a thing that was draining capacity, but rather extending it and adding to it. So this slide could be one that's on uh, next month, but it, but it is a decision point for us to think about. As uh, Corey mentioned before, we, we uh, really thought long and hard on who would be a, a best fit, and we've, we've chosen Pat, and we've kind of worked with him on what could be some of the, the uh, principal areas to focus in, one being the capstone, and then a, one or two others being like uh, connected areas, but that we could that we could help mine both his his ability to bring benefit, but also just extend equity areas that we need to grow. And uh, the idea is to align this exactly with our SR3 application, and it's already it's one of the areas. In other words, in terms of maintenance of equity. And uh, with that, I would mention that the. The two years of access to national, uh, national experts is something that, that really poises us in a, in a great space to be thinking, to be asking questions, to be kind of extending our vision across the next two years and continually solving problems, kind of like they were showing that video. That was just one thing that they solved during their Strategic Data Project Fellowship. So with that, I'd like to pause. There's a lot to reflect on. Ask if anyone has any questions. Mr. Brown. Well, for starters, you had me at hello. You, I mean, <laughs> this is hitting right where we need to be. Um, equity is what we've had an emphasis on, and I don't know any way of getting to that other than d diving deeper into indoor data. And uh, I've known Pat a long time. I think it's the right person. So um, this is, I, can we get started now? <laughs> the, you said the application is ready to go? Go ahead and send it in. <laughs> I'm very supportive. All right. Did I see someone else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Bros. Yeah, this is my language. I like to have data, and I like to be able to make good, solid decisions on solid information rather than on soft data, and maybe we can even firm up some of the soft data in the process. So I think this is just outstanding, and it's a positive for our district, especially on track to thrive for 2025. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. 8.3 is the full service community school. Dr. Dexter. All right. And uh, we alluded to this a little bit in our workshop. And this will be just for information. And we were um, approached by the Nebraska Department of Ed, and the Nebraska Department of Ed and Nebraska Children and Family Foundation are partnering, partnering to providing and supporting um, to implement and sustain full service community schools in four selected communities. And selected was kind of cool that they reached out to us and said, please apply. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so South Sioux, Fremont, Schuyler, and Grand Island Public Schools. And um, largely in part because of our work specifically Jennifer to get extended learning opportunities um, in our all of our schools and in the Lincoln Community Schools project. Um, so the allocated funds would provide support for the planning, implementation, and operation of full service community schools that improve the coordination, integration, accessibility, and effectiveness of services for children and families. Full service community schools provide comprehensive academic, social, and health services for students, students, family members, and community members that would result in improved educational outcomes for children. So when we were approached, um, we would get $150,000 each year for two years. Um, NDE really believes that there'll be at least another two years, if not more. They feel like the um, Federal Department of Education is really gonna make um, community schools a priority and after school programs a priority. So um, they're very encouraged that this would um, have some sustainability um, through grant funding. Um, we met um, with L4L, uh, Hall County, County Community Collaborative, um, Early Child Education Coordinator, um, the Cabinet, and, and Nebraska Department of Ed. And we brainstormed, okay, we could do one school, we had to hire a coordinator, and then the remaining funds could be for activities. And so we just thought about 
where could we have the most impact on families and help them feel engaged and move them forward? And I thought immediately of early childhood education. Um, Amy has been talking about having this type of program in the early childhood education center for since she's been here. And so we re reached out to Amy and she was on board. Um, we really feel like she, we want to bring families into the early childhood education center, get into classrooms, um, really teach them how to be a parent. You know, the majority of our parents in the early childhood education program um, did not graduate from high school. So um, they, they don't have a real positive um, idea of what school is like. So again, then those families that go to the early childhood education center will then be moving into kindergarten in schools all across Grand Island. So we want to teach them to be advocates and um, to be a, feel a real part of their school. Um, this will be um, many activities in, you know, in the evenings, throughout the day, and um, to, to move that forward. So we would be looking at hiring a coordinator and we w adopted or stole from, um, they had examples of the job description and so we will be, um, we've already started to advertise for that position. Um, social work is a uh, worker background we think would be the best fit. Um, then with the coordinator for Lincoln, um, we decided that it was important to use our Title I funds to um, make that a coordinator position in the similar job description to this new grant funding. And then that person could possibly do Lincoln and one other school. But the key thing is that these two positions would work closely together to design programs and to support schools. The other piece of the early childhood education at the O'Connor Learning Center, um, we'd also support Howard, Star and Lincoln Preschools um, and their families um, on site or at the new um, Early Childhood Education Center. So, um, and there's also an outside um, grant um, evaluator, so there will be evaluation and monitoring as we move forward. So, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Nope. You, do you want to? <laughs> Are you talking me into this? Well, you look like you're going to push well, it. This, <clears throat> these last two items are just really, um, again, it, it really uh, is a direction that we've been saying we need to go. The strategic plan tells us that we need to go there. This is just another step of catching our parents and our kids right when they entered our school district. What a great time to get them involved in the, the community. So uh, very supportive again. Yeah, yeah. We just can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Grover wants me to remind us that it's a new location, thanks to all of us. <laughs> and Dr. it's Brooks. looking wonderful. <laughs> it's just. And the application has an outside evaluator. Are the criteria already set for that evaluation, or are they using what we have, what we're submitting? Um, no, that that will be. Um, and the, they have a new person at NDE who is assigned to full service community schools, first time ever. And she has experience with running uh, full service community schools. So the evaluation is already in place and ready to go. But we know what that yep. is. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, 8.4 is the recommendation to name the principal building, Dr. Dexter. All right. Um, we, as we were moving forward, people kept asking us, well, what, are we, what name do we use? And we can't keep calling it the principal building um, because they own that name. And so, um, you know, Dr. Grover asked us to pull a committee together and, 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 and get a name that we could start using. Um, and this will be information tonight and action in July. Um, we pulled together Natalie Lucan, Lukens, a GI patron, Lisa Muller, um, Lindsay Jurgens, Josh Hawley, Josh Planos, um, Allison Bailey and myself um, met and we uh, and as a cabinet we just kind of brainstormed some names that we could get the committee started um, but we reviewed the charge of the committee we reviewed the policy on naming of facilities and then we just started throwing out names and you know brainstorming what would work and not work you know we talked about the GIPS education annex and the definition of the annex a building joined to or associated with a main building providing additional space or accommodations annex that just fit for what we're using it for at this point 
Um, we know that as we move forward with the facilities planning that it could be um, something different, but for now, um, we're looking for that name. And then we talked about GIPS Educational Center. We thought that would be confusion with UNL Center, um, the Early Childhood O'Connor Learning Center. So we wanted something different. Um, you know, one of the people on our committee uh, works for a principal and we just um, asked, well, what would, you know, principal call it? And she said, well, we have started calling, um, using the address. So it'd be GIPS 3520 College Street. And we just didn't think that would fit. Um, <laughs> And then we just talked about, well, let's just call it the Annex. And then um, people would tend to call it the Annex. And so what does that mean? Um, we talked about naming patterns um, uh, because we've started just like with the early childhood education at um, uh, the Academy of Education, Public Law and Safety at Wyandotte. So we worked through some of that. Um, and then, um, we talked about, well, let's use Annex, but let's make it GIPS Islander Annex because we're really promoting that we're all Islanders and um, we just felt like that that would really work. Um, better together, we were all one, that flexibility in what can be at that building. And um, so that's the name that we landed on and would like to recommend it to the board um, for the name of the right now principal building, GIPS Islander Annex. All right, any questions or comments? No? Well, good work, and thank you to the committee for doing that. All right, I think you must be up again. Yeah. <laughs> 8.5, the resolution for open enrollment, Dr. Dexter. Yeah, and I come to you every year. Um, we have the resolution, and this will be information and action tonight. Um, the um, action would need to be read, the full resolution. Um, but this is... For option students requesting to come in, we just we are over capacity at our in our special ed programs, and we're known for having phenomenal special ed programs. And we knew that when we dissolve the co-op, that it would be real easy for um, other districts, to possibly, to say uh, go enroll in Grand Island option in, and they they have the um, special ed programs um, that we don't have. So that reason, but the number one reason is. We space and capacity, um, we just cannot accept um, option students into our programs. So we pass this resolution every year um, stating that, um, that, and that allows us to deny um, option enrollments into our special ed programs. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments? And is, this is up for vote later tonight, yes. right? Okay. Yes. Mr. We wouldn't be separating. Excuse me. We wouldn't be separating the families, obviously, right, on this with the enrollment. Um, just to give you an example, we have a family that had two siblings already option in, and the the third child um, was on an IEP because of the siblings already optioned in, they would come in. But if there was a family that was new, we would deny that student, and then the family would have to decide. Okay, great. Thank you. Good question. All right. Thank you very much. We will move on now. We will move on now to 8.6 extra standard committee recommendations. Mr. Stelk. Good evening. Um, as a matter of, I guess, a little bit of history for some of the folks, maybe that are a bit newer to the board, um, we have what we call an extra standard salary schedule, and the extra standard salary schedule is a requirement of our negotiated agreement with GIA, but um, the actual decision-making and recommendations to the board through the negotiated agreement is passed to the Extra Standard Committee. So the Extra Standard Committee does meet on an annual basis, and um, what the Extra Standard Salary Schedule covers is um, those additional assignments that certified staff primarily would have to their regular teaching contract for coaching and club sponsorships and those types of things. So um, things like you know, middle school athletic coaching, and uh, some of the fine arts sponsorships, some of the uh, clubs and associations that are part of uh, the various academies, uh, FBLA and, and HOSA and some of those types of things all fall under the extra standard uh, salary schedule. So every year we uh, meet as a group and we talk about um, any adjustments that need to be made to the salary schedule, if there are recommendations for new positions to be added to the salary schedule, and just you know talk about uh, any changes that need to be made. 
<clears throat> we have kind of a uh, operating practice where we say, okay, we spend X amount of dollars for extra standard. Uh, that's the, the um, compensation that we pay for the coaches and the sponsors. And then we apply the percentage that we agree to with the negotiated agreement uh, negotiations to that uh, compensation amount to give us the pool of dollars to work with. So we kind of have an idea um, how we can spend within uh, the parameters of what's uh, been identified in the negotiated agreement. So this year uh, we had that settlement of about 3.31% with the Teachers Association. So if you multiply that times our total cost of extra standard, that gave us a pool of $37,453. I'm fogging over in 80 cents. So out of that pool of dollars then, uh, the first thing we always do is we talk about what it will cost to fund the movement because there is a longevity movement through the salary schedule as you have more years of experience. And then we also, so that the um, coaching salaries kind of keep pace with, you know, the the cost of living, so to speak, increase. Every year we base those um, um, compensation amounts for the individual coaching positions as a percent of the base salary. And the base salary is always set as the base salary of the prior year. So there's a little bit of an increase to the base and then there's movement on the salary schedule. So when we calculate that, that left us with um, $3,748.20 to spend on some of the recommendations for changes. So what we um, do as a committee is we go through all of the proposals, we you know, talk about the rationale for those, and then we go through kind of a prioritization process and then basically look at what the cost of each of those would be. And we start saying, okay, if we fund the first one, that takes X amount from the available dollars we have to spend, go down to the second, the third. When we've spent the dollars, then we say, okay, that's all we can do for this year. If there's a unique circumstance that needs to be addressed and we have to come to the board and say, you know, we're gonna to need to ask for additional authority to spend on extra standard beyond what our standard practices have been. So I apologize for the long explanation, but I thought the history might be a little bit helpful. So what we uh, are recommending as an information item, we'll bring it back next month for action, is um, the addition of uh, three positions to the extra standard salary schedule. One of those is uh, Senior Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America, the FCCLA. That is a, um, a uh, um, club that's recognized through the uh, State Association, and it is part of uh, the, one of the career academies as far as an offering with, uh, within one of the career committees. So it's tied towards providing additional opportunities for students who are in the, that particular career academy. There is um, the senior mock trial, and again, this would be uh, tied to the uh, uh, academy where, um, you know, the is it public safety education and law, I believe, uh, where they're able to uh, get that exposure and experience working with attorneys on, on trial settings and things like that. And then uh, the senior sound system operator position. Um, the senior sound system operator position, of course, is position that uh, takes care of um, that big television that's in the stadium, <laughs> the Megatron or whatever that's called. Um, but it's, you know, it's turned out to be, uh, a, it's a great opportunity for students. Again, it ties to students that are in um, that, you know, that uh, career pathway. Um, but it also is, is a, a large responsibility just because of the amount of use it's going to have and all hours of, of the day and days of the week. So. If we um, fund all of those, that will spend just a little bit more than the available balance. It's about $2,000 more than the available balance. But um, we felt that those three were you know, definitely priorities that we wanted to, uh, to have funded. So, um, so that's the recommendation that's being brought. And again, um, we'll answer any questions that you have tonight and then uh, bring it back for action at the July meeting. So I'd answer any questions. Anyone have any questions? Uh, I would just share that I was on the, the committee this year, and as always, we have more requests than we have money. And like you mentioned, we did prioritize the, the positions that were tied to academies, but we've also talked a little bit about that we've had the long-range plan for extracurriculars that we've gone through and lots of needs identified within there. So I'm assuming that, you know, that things may change throughout the year with this as we continue to figure out how we want to move forward. Very possibly, yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, uh, we went through that one. So 8.8 .8 is turn it up, and Mr. Phillips wasn't able to be here tonight, so Ms. Bailey is going to present. Hi there. If you haven't had a chance to meet me, I'm Dr. Allison Bailey, and I'm director of the Garrett Promise um, grant program that GIPS has had for three years, and we're about to start our fourth year. Um, Mr. Phillips asked me to speak to you tonight about Turnitin. Turnitin is a plagiarism checker program. So our high school teachers um, that are currently, like they're using Canvas, as you probably know, it's a platform that you add in. So when students submit their papers, that you, it runs through the program to help check with plagiarism, as well as provide feedback to students on how they can improve their writing, which really ties in with our literacy initiatives here in the district. Um, and so just to let you know, it's about $30,000 for four, a four-year contract. It will be paid for by Gear Up Funds. And so he just asked me to come and tell you about it, provide you some basic information, and answer any questions that you have. Ms. Wolf. I don't have a question. Um, I've util utilized Turnitin, and it's a great tool, and something that's neat is you can't plagiarize yourself either. So I was going to say Turnitin. Um, it goes up into a file or it's documented and then we have access to it as a district. And then if you write that same paper or a similar paper, um, then you can't plagiarize yourself either. But it's a wonderful tool and it's a great teaching technique because sometimes you just realize you cited something wrong. So. I sure wish I had had that when I was teaching senior English. <laughs> yes, it's very helpful. As a former university professor, I've used Turnitin for ever. So, okay. Well, I don't think there's any other questions, and it sounds like it's a good deal. So, thank you for being here tonight. All right. 8.9 is the master agreement with Engineer Technologies ETI. Mr. Schroeder. Good evening, folks. Uh, attached to agenda item 8.9 is a proposed master agreement with ETI. We have a need to renew the current agreement with ETI as it's going to be expiring here in the coming months. We discussed this item and this need in facilities and finance committee. The proposed agreement has been reviewed by the district's legal service, uh, Mr. Roger Steele. Keep in mind what you see in front of you is a non-exclusive agreement so we can acquire other firms professional services as needed. The rates for services were reviewed by Mr. Harden and myself. They remain the same as the previous agreement so there's no increase uh, in the rates for services. The major change and really the only change in the agreement is the duration of the agreement. Um, that's shifting from a set number of years to a perpetual agreement. But uh, no worries. There's also a clause in that agreement that uh, with or without cause, either party can end the agreement with 30 days written notice. So this agreement is in front of you tonight for review and consideration. It'll come back on the July board agenda for final approval. If between that time span, any of you board members have questions for me regarding the agreement, uh, please reach out to me or a member of the FNF committee. Okay. All right, are there any questions right now or comments? No. Nope. And I would agree the FNF committee has reviewed it, so. Okay, eight, number eight is the master agreement with Canon Mossberger and Associates, Associates also, Mr. Schroeder. Yes, and we're in a very similar situation with the CMBA master agreement. And so it pretty much mirrors what I told you about the ETI agreement. It is also a non-exclusive agreement which has been reviewed by district legal counsel. It's also set up in that perpetual manner. And so if, as you review it between this board meeting and the next, you have any questions or concerns, 
please reach out to me or to FNF committee members. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to 8.11, which is the construction update. Mr. Petch. Uh, thanks, President Hinkle. Um, we had a construction meeting uh, yesterday at, uh, at the ELC, um, just uh, looking at track and progress. Um, we have been having some floor material issues, um, causing some delay in our, in our uh, project. Um, I think we have it ironed out, but uh, just a manufacturer issue. Um, so we'll have some more material we'll have to come from them to get in, but they have started the flooring. It's looking great. Uh, they've got the most of the ceiling grid in. Uh, so the inside of the project's coming along pretty well. As long as the floors don't um, give us any snaf more snafus, you know, we're still looking to uh, be ready to occupy mid-July. Um, so the you know parking lot, as usual, we go and start removals uh, for some of the work we're going to do in the parking lot, and it rains. And then it dried out this week. It's going to rain again tonight, so, <laughs> you know, I guess we just kind of get used to that. Every, every year I say the same thing. If we get started and then it rains on us and we stop and then we get going, so. I uh, don't expect that to impact the end of the project, though, so. Um, you know, it's, uh, Amy was over there with us yesterday, too, and, and she's uh, very excited. Um, so we're just getting ready for the move. Um, we also um, are setting up some more additional meetings uh, for the medical pathway. Uh, we've had several so far, I'm just uh, working on the programming. Um, you know, when we do an elementary, uh, I can tell you what that's gonna look like most of the time because we've done it before and uh, it's not quite as uh, complicated uh, where this is. We've never done a, a medical pathway uh, situation, so. But our design professionals have, and so they're leading us through that. We're getting a lot of input from staff, and uh, it's come along pretty well. So with that, I'll conclude my report and answer any questions you might have. All right. That's exciting. Any questions or comments? Nope. All right. Well, thank you. We will move on to 8.2, our superintendent report, Dr. Grover. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, first of all, I do want to add an additional congratulations uh, to Pat. We are so proud of him. Um, and just to try to make that link back to uh, the strategic plan, um, we, we've started with Empower Personalized Design and Partner Net Design with designing our decisions around data. And that's something that we have been trying to, first of all, get our infrastructure up. And Corey's been able to, Mr. Gerhardt's been able to do that uh, through Synergy and some other resources. And so now just moving into... Uh, a deeper dive in regards to what we talked about earlier. Um, so we're just glad that Pat was up for it. They were texting me while they were in the interview. I was like, have they selected him yet? Have they named him? And so we are just uh, super excited. And I do want to thank the Board of Education because if you kind of look back, and I'm sure this is probably um, even before my tenure, you invest a lot um, in staff members in regards to professional development. And so when we can build our talent as we think about turnover and things like that, and also just making sure even as we have people change positions or something like that happen, we know that we have talent in-house that we can utilize. And so thank you so much for supporting uh, that as we bring it um, for further consideration next month. Also, just um, we are continuing to uh, assemble our pandemic team uh, we continue to uh, consult the, the facts, the data. I think we had a breakthrough uh, this week. I told the team I never thought that I would hear uh, Phil use the words exceptional and our positivity rate uh, within our community <laughs> in the same sentence. Um, and so just, if, just I wish you could probably just hear some of the talent sometimes along with Lee Jacobson. Um, he had done his own research and called a number of different schools and did a lot of follow-up. And we really see this as an opportunity, as a step forward uh, to be able to uh, reduce the restrictions that's been our goal. Uh, and so we did announce this week that effective Monday, June 14th, that max, uh, mask will be optional within our summer school cohort at classrooms. Um, the students still need to bring the mask uh, to school just for when they are uh, kind of in common areas and so forth. But I thought this was uh, even more telling because we do try to make our decisions based on data. 
Even though we sent it out, we still want to be mindful of our teachers. How did they feel about it? We know we hear a lot of vocal, you know, voices sometimes, but we don't know we want to represent all of our people. We're here for all of our students as well as our staff. So we did send out um, a survey to our staff and I guess around midday today, and we just sent it out last night, of course, um, we had 108 responses and there are about a little over 200 um, folks that are working summer school. So more than 50% responded, I mean, within less than 24 hours. Um, and 94.4% of the people said that they are comfortable with the change to allow unmasking in the schools. Uh, the other option, 5.6 uh, people said they are comfortable, um, but they may wear a mask, um, but there was no one that said they pushed back on it, saying, you know, I can't work here any longer because you changed the policy. It was zero when it came to that. So I think that's huge support uh, from our staff. Uh, we also sent information um, out to our parents too. Um, and I think, uh, of course, they just received the email just about mid-morning. Um, and I do believe that we're in pretty much the same uh, predicament. Our parent survey went out around 10.30 today. Uh, at that time, we only had 10 people to respond, but it was at 100% rate that they are happy about it. So I'm going to take that 100%. Just a few of the comments um, from the staff. They said, I'm fully vaccinated. Thank you for GIPS for moving towards this and helping us get vaccinated early in the school year. Um, I'm fully vaccinated. Thank you for this change. Best news yet. Um, and then we also had very glad for this change. Just only wish you had done it sooner. So, um, and we also, we had a lot of discussion about once the students start taking off their masks, there are some kids that want to keep them on. How will they be treated, you know, as far as just um, having a level of confidence and so forth. And I love one of the quotes um, from one of the teachers. She said, if some students still want to wear a mask, I may wear one so that they aren't alone. Oh, and those are the types of teachers that we have in Grand Island Public Schools. So just a follow up with that, um, we have start, we convene um, our meeting back with our local medical officials uh, this week. And we've added some new um, faces. Um, I know we had Dr. Leonard, um, he was not on our team um, before, uh, he's here in town. We also had the pediatrician from Heartland Health, I can't remember her name, I could get you a list of those. Um, but along with uh, Central District Health Department, Dr. Warner is still uh, in the group as well um, as uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Stanky, who we all know. Um, and so they were all there. Um, and we really did express, again, that we we're trying to be on the road to reduce restrictions and how can we get that accomplished. I think we still have some, um, you know, considerations as we think about the age of students that are receiving the vaccine and where it's not quite available yet. Um, but with some safety infrastructure, uh, we're very hopeful um, in the team right now. They're currently working um, on our return to school plan. We do have a new date. I know I had originally said that it would be, uh, we would put it out by August the 1st. That timeline has actually moved up. Um, as we kind of work through our ESSER funding, they have a requirement that is out by July 15th. So we would no later than July 15th, we need to have it up. Our goal is to have it up by July 6th because we do want to be able to give parents an opportunity to give us some feedback. Uh, so the team is, I mean, they're just working uh, around the clock to try to get uh, the new return to school plan, but hopefully it will be fewer pages uh, this year. Uh, the vaccine is really, uh, you know, it's one part. Remember we talked about um, the different layers of the safety inf infrastructure. So the vaccine is one of them. And so we're very fortunate that we have partnered with Central District Health Department. Um, and we do have some clinics that start, uh, actually one this Saturday, June the 12th. And I know I have some board members that are signed up to help support that. The other dates, uh, that will be at Lincoln Elementary School, June 26th, Walnut, July 10th, Lincoln, and then July 24th back at Walnut. Um, and so uh, if I think we sent out a sign up sheet, you're welcome to sign up. We will be giving away free t-shirts. I hear they're pretty cool. Uh, so you may want to grab one if you come out. Um, and then we'll also be providing some food for families um, as well. Uh, again, I know you've heard us say this a lot, uh, but I do want to thank the Central District Health Department because again, they went after um, a grant, some funds that were available from the state to be able to host these clinics. Um, and also they're going to um, help to provide pay uh, reimbursement for some of the staff that might be working um, as well as they, we also talked to them about, you know, making the vaccines available because some of the doctor's offices in town, they did not really even have enough supply um, either. And so she has also partnered with them. So 
we really do feel like the more locations we have, the more accessible the vaccine will be to those who need it uh, and desire it. So um, that's on the way. Um, and you heard from us tonight on our GIPS On Track to Thrive. That work uh, continues. We're looking forward to our stakeholder engagement opportunities for the On Track to Thrive. It is on our website. Um, this is an opportunity for us to, again, align our resources with our current work that's happening. And so we're really excited about that. So that concludes my report for tonight. I will entertain any questions. Okay. No questions, but nice report. Thank you. Okay, we will move to action items. Number 9.1 is the transportation contract. Dr. Dexter. And I presented this as information last month, and then this is for action, and you have the contract, and you also have the um, bus schedule and cost for 21-22. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments? Mr. Brown. I would move to approve the five-year transportation contract with Doc Holiday Express Company. And is there a second? Second. Second, Dr. Bros. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes, thank you. 9.2 is the resolution for open option enrollment, sorry, option enrollment. Let me make sure I say that clearly. Um, and whoever makes the recommendation does need to read the, the resolution. A any questions, first of all? No. All right, Mrs. Albers. Let me make sure my glasses are clean. Here we go. I just started, okay. Re resolution number 2021061010 underscore 01, a resolution to adopt specific standards for acceptance and rejection of enrollment option student applications for the 2021-2022 school year. Just a second. Uh, whereas ne Nebraska rev, what is, what it was? Revised statute. 79-238 reissue 2014 requires the Board of Education at Grand Island Public Schools hereafter the district to adopt by resolution specific standards for acceptance and rejection of enrollment option applications and whereas the specific standards for acceptance and rejection of enrollment option applications shall be determined by setting a maximum number of option students the district will accept in any program, class, grade level, or school building based upon available staff, facilities, projected enrollment of resident students, projected number of students with which the district will contract based on existing contractual arrangements and availability of appropriate special education programs and whereas pursuant to 79-238 the Board of Education has determined the maximum number of enrollment op option applications the district may accept for the 2021-2022 school year now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Education of Grand Island Public Schools Grand Island Nebraska as follows one the maximum number of enrollment option applications for special education students the district will accept is limited as set forth in the attachment which shows current program capacity projected enrollment and the number of special education option students who may be accepted at certain schools within the, within the district adopted by the Board of Education at Grand Island Public Schools, Grand Island, Nebraska, on this 10th day of June, 2021. And is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. Barsonis. Any discussion? Please vote. Okay, motion passes. Okay, thank you. Uh, 9.3 is the turn it in that we just heard about, Ms. Bailey again. Did you have anything else that you wanted to tell us that you thought of before we talk about it? No, I think you you know what turn it is <laughs> and it is and it really will help our students. It's what they're gonna experience when they go to college. So okay. anybody think of any questions that you want to ask for clarification? Nope. All right. Mr. Barsonis. Approve uh, make a recommendation to approve the turn it in plagiarism add on to Canvas that is Sponsored by Gear Up and requested four-year com commitment with pricing not to exceed a total of thirty thousand over the four years. And is there a second? Second, second Ms. Wolf. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, nine point four. 
payment. Is that right? Yeah, this is a different one from the international. Okay, sorry. This uh, 9.4 is the Canon Mossberger and Associates contract, Mr. Dan Petch. And this is specifically for the CHI medical pathway. Mm -hmm. And he's talking. <laughs> We're voting on the, uh, the CMBA for CHI. And this is this is for project specific for the medical pathways. So, okay. any new information that you need to share with us? I do not. Okay, Mr. Brown. I would move to approve the contract as presented between the Grand Island Public Schools and Canon Mossberger and Associates. And is there a second? Second. I think I heard Mrs. Albers first. Sorry. <laughs> um, any discussion? Oh, please vote. All right, motion passes. Thank you. Now you can exit. <laughs> okay, so committee reports. Uh, Ten point one is facility and fi oh well, let's try that differently. Finance and facilities committee, Mr. Brown. Thank you. I'll be re reporting from the minutes from June first. Um, we did review uh, the request for proposals, which would be a sign at Walnut. Um, nutrition services did not have a report. Um, the IT um, uh, had some current work with Ezra funding. Um, one of the concerns is actually supply of new laptops. Um, typically, we would be showing up about now and just concerned that they may not get here for our new, our new teacher. So keep your fingers crossed. Um, reviewed all the the funds um, let's see we did review the rental rates and processing which is basically the rental rates for all of our facilities when they're not being used for schools and there'll be some slight changes there um, we did review the extra standard recommendations as we heard this evening from mr. Stelk uh, the, the classified um, Salary uh, scheduled uh, was discussed with Mr. Stelk as well, um, namely the entry level positions um, and knowing that we may have to make some increases to attract um, anyone, and I do mean anyone, uh, to fill those positions. Um, let's see, we did review the master contract with Canon again and ETI as we discussed uh, and proved. Um, previously um, let's see hmm. we did review the project list again um, looking at some ways that we can maybe use some of the Ezra uh, three funding um, to um, complete at least one or a couple of the projects um, there is uh, we reviewed the regional planning commission no notices as always and there was one potential TIF project there um, uh, again, heard the update for on the Early Learning Center um, with flooring, as Mr. Pesh said. Um, and uh, yeah, um, with that, I conclude my report. Um, next meeting will be Tuesday, June 29th at 7.30. All right, thank you. 10.2 is the leading for learning committee, Mrs. Jurgens. Yes, thank you. I will be reporting on the minutes from June 1st. Uh, to be honest, most of this content was discussed already tonight, so I'm just going to roll right through it. We had the com community schools grant that Dr. Dexter discussed. We got to look at the graduation requirements, also thanks to Dr. Dr. Dexter. We heard the update on JAG, which is super amazing. Uh, Mr. Phillips did share on eDynamics. He presented on the middle school, college, and career exploration program through eDynamics. He walked through the components of the curriculum and alignment to the academies. The team of teachers will come together this summer to map out the curriculum for 7th and 8th grade. We are still reading grading for equity. We reviewed chapters 2 through 7, and we still need to complete 8 through 13. Uh, for some information, June 2nd Academic Summit leadership teams will reflect on the 2021 accomplishments and set goals for 21-22. June 3rd Leadership Institute 
all school administrators engage in professional learning and develop plans for leading the continuous improvement plan focused on results. New teacher training is planned with input and guidance from first and second year teachers and administrator representation from each level. Task force teams started meeting May 25th and will meet through July. And 228 students registered for the K-5 virtual Zern math intervention. Students attending June 7th through June, excuse me, through July 2nd, on-site summer school at Stolly Park, Westridge, and Barr will also be participating. And we meet again on July 6th at 4 p.m. via Zoom. Okay, thank you very much. 10.3 is the personnel committee, Mr. Brown. I'm back. Uh, I'll be reporting for the minutes from June 2nd. Uh, Mr. Stelk did report that uh, Kristen, is it Kristen Irie, has accepted the position of the Chief of Human Capital Management and will begin on July 19th of this year. Um, Dr. Dexter had reported um, on, this is actually a position we've already talked about with the community and uh, family outreach liaison, which we've heard about this evening. Um, we did talk about the DMG um, study um, with the strategic planning or strategic budgeting and that kind of return on investment. Um, and they had some sessions earlier this, this month um, and hopefully um, rolling that into the on track thrive for 2025. Um, we also reviewed the substitute um, teacher fill rate and for last the school year um, ended up at 89.63%, which compares to 91.8% from the last full year, um, the 18-19 year. So down just a little bit. Obviously there were some reasons for that. Um, and uh, we also were looking at, again, talking about the um, hiring a classified staff knowing that we may need to um, look at the adjustments in the in the wages and I think Mr. Stock is planning on bringing that back in July. Um, the district has um, issued 67 certified contracts and approximately 15 vacancies remain. Um, that was in certifi certified classified staffing. Um, uh, there'll be oops. The intent is to, uh, for the return letters to be mailed around July 1st, uh, and then we'll be filling vacancies from there. The administra administrative staffing, um, we did have Christina Hirschman will be the new Skills Academy Coordinator. Michelle Soundry will be joining the district as the Academy um, Experienced Liaison. Amber High has accepted one of the two Gear Up ac academic uh, coach positions. And we are still looking, or we just started recruiting for the Director of Strategic Communication. Um, with that, I conclude my report. Our next meeting will be June 30th at 8.30. Okay, thank you very much. 10.4 is the Policy Committee, Mr. Hawley. I'll be reporting on the minutes from our meeting on June 7th, 4.30. Uh, we reviewed several policies, 2111 Board Operating Principles, Dr. Dexter shared that uh, Mrs. Hinkle cross-referenced policy to operating principles. Uh, the equity statement had been suggested as an addition to the student commitments under the educational advocate principle. As discussed before, the NSBA graphic describing the chain of command was added within the policy document and will be an online link. The end goal of this policy online is to build links uh, and cross-reference policies and documents. The policy committee evaluated this policy in 2230 to avoid redundancy. Uh, the proposal is just to list examples of committees and operating principles with a link to 2230. Governance committee was added as a standing committee. PPRD was added as an ad hoc committee uh, in policy 2230. Dr. Dextro will go ahead and update with the proposed edits and return to the committee for review. Policy 1110, statement of philosophy and mission. Uh, there was a proposal to delete, this, to delete this policy due to the redundancy, uh, so that'll move forward to the board. Policy 2160, uh, the policy on policy adoption. Dr. Dexter reviewed in an NASB and added information that she discovered uh, suggested edits were approved. That'll move forward to the board as well. Policy 2220 for board officers. Dr. Dexter reviewed again the NASB and proposed edits to the language. The proposal to add reference to non member secretary and treasurer positions. Discussion to develop a recommendation and approval process for these non member positions. 
Uh, Dr. Dexter will work on it a draft and return to the committee. Policy 2230, board committees. The policy was closely evaluated with 2111 to avoid redundancy and make sure committee lists were focused into this policy. Proposed edits are to make sure descriptions of committees and examples are clearly identified and recognized in the policy. Dr. Dexter is going to update that and return it to the committee for review. Policy 2231, ad hoc committees, task force, and advisory councils. Uh, the proposal to delete this policy due to redundancy. 2440, the rules of order. Dr. Dexter explained that this policy is required by statute to identify guidance that the Board of Education uses to conduct meetings. Discussion about grammar and language used in the policy. Uh, Dr. Dexter will update with proposed edits and move forward to the board. Transportation 5310, uh, Dr. Dexter explained the proposed edits are to add policy on transporting students by taxi service used by GAPS outreach programs such as families in transition and migrant ELL. That'll move forward to the board. Uh, policy 5523 data and record retention. Dr. Dexter proposed edits to several record categories after consultation with legal and IT that will move forward to the board. Uh, we had some discuss. We didn't have discussion on the NDE requirements versus GIPS requirements for graduation. Um, Dr. Dexter is currently working with Mr. Gilbertson on Policy 2216, uh, which is the Board of Education Student Member Application and Scoring Rubric. Uh, policy 3212 was tabled at this time. The next meeting is July 12th, 4:30 p.m. via Zoom, and that concludes my report. Okay. Thank you very much. 10.5, the Public Relations and Partnership Development Committee did not meet last month, so there's no report. So we'll move to 10.6, the Grand Island Public Schools Foundation Report, Mrs. Jurgens. Thank you. I'll be reporting on the minutes from May 19th at 5.15. The meeting was in person for a change at the GI Literacy Council. The foundation received approximately 875 nominations for 316 teachers and staff for the 2021 Extraordinary Heroes in Education. The office is currently working on getting these nominations mailed out with a gift celebrating our extraordinary heroes in education. The corporate sponsor of this program is First National Bank. The foundation was happy to help access funding to provide food at the GIPS vaccine clinics this summer. The foundation board will have the following business before them at their June 16th, 2021 meeting. And that is the Miller Legacy Scholarship for graduate programs for GIPS staff and the 2021 audit engagement. The foundation board will also review the 2021 scholarship program statistics, including feedback from reviewers and the annual scholarship application integrity audit. The foundation board will not meet in July. And that is the conclusion. All right, thank you very much. 10.7, the Governor's Committee did not meet this month, so no report. 10.8, the GNSA Legislative Committee, there's no update because the legislature is closed. Woohoo! Um, oh, did I say that out loud? 10.9 um, is the NASB monthly update, and the, that is attached for us to see, but at this time, um, Ms. Wolf, Mrs. Albers, and myself did attend the NASB School Leader and Law Conference last week in Kearney on June 3rd, and we're each going to give three quick bullet points of what we thought we heard. It was a really excellent conference. So, Mrs. Albers, would you like to start? Um, I really I like that conference a lot. Um, I like listening to Colby's kind of rehash of the legislative session. Um, it was long and arduous we weren't the only district that felt that everybody felt that and it's nice to get that affirmation um one thing that they kind of rehashed that i've i knew but it's nice to hear is just the importance of having partners as we try to convince senators what is actually the best for public schools in in this case i'm talking about uh, the gips foundation and tracy skullberg because she really worked hard getting um her friends in the foundation world to talk to um, our local senators just about being treated fairly when it comes to tax credits and tax deductions. Um, and even though the next ledge session is a short one, everyone's already dreading it, uh, including Colby and including me and including <laughs> pretty much everybody. We're gonna have some big fights on our hands next year. Um, Senator Wayne will be bringing back uh, LB 364, 
I get that number right? And um, that's, that's going to be a difficult one for us. So rest up over the summer, friends. So, and that concludes my report. Okay, Ms. Wu. You would think it was my first day, sorry. Um, I went to one uh, that the KSB law firm um, presented on in regards to thinking about special education and, and legal issues, and, and particularly in regards to COVID and the pandemic and just being mindful of how things have been different or haven't been different and if it still has followed special, special education law. Um, and if you know the KSB law firm, they always put on an entertaining show for you um, as well. And I also got to play um, Employer Jeopardy and they provided us with um, situations. KSB law was there, but they weren't the primary presenters. And just, and they touched on Title IX a little bit in regards to situations and being mindful that if there was a Title IX situation on the employment side, um, to remember that there are federal guidelines and regulations in place and to, to make sure that you're being very mindful of them. Um, no bad bobs out there um, thinking to go out and investigate things on your own as a board member because that is not your role or responsibility um, and just reminding us of of being careful of that, especially if it comes up with anything with Title IX. Thank you very much. And just to piggyback a little on what Mrs. Albers talked about, how we will have a fight on our hands, um, because we already know there's some bills set to go, you know, up day one. Uh, one thing that they shared with us that we just all need to kind of take a pause and think about this, uh, there was a point when an amendment was put on the floor to get, a, get rid of TIOSA, which is the school funding formula. There was no alternative included in that amendment. It was just to get rid of that. 21 center, senators voted in favor of that, including Senator Aguilar. So we, we do have some work to do um, to make them, and they are, as you know, they're gonna have that committee this year to look at school funding, but they chose not to have anyone but a committee of state legislatures on there so uh something else we heard you know just talk again how the thought process is that schools just need to be controlled um you know the governor feels that the only way to bring down property taxes is to control spending at the local level and since 2011 school districts growth is three percent and that's all and per student the growth is 2.11 percent and the, i thought this one was pretty interesting the cost per student uh, in nebraska we rank 21st in the nation and our cost per student per mile is 0 0.0002 so i mean we're doing a pretty good job but for some reason i don't know it's it's coming after us and then the other thing i heard um, that passed and because we got a review of everything that passed good bad and ugly was the name of the session um and one thing i thought was just really cool is that the suicide prevention hotline needs to be printed on all middle school and high school uh students student ids and i think that's pretty cool and it sounds like we're already in in works with that um, and then the other thing, we had the pleasure of, of listening to the history of when Grand Island Public Schools um, filed the lawsuit <laughs> with the state and the outcome of that and stuff, and that was very interesting. We, we really appreciated hearing that, so. But very well done conference. But no masks, no social distancing, lots of people were there. It was different, so. All right. Agenda 11 is executive session for the purpose of superintendent's evaluation because it is in the best interest of the public to discuss this matter in closed session. I would need a recommendation for that. All Mr. Right. Barsonis. Make a recommendation for the board to convene to executive session for the purpose of discussing the superintendent's evaluation. And do I have a second? Second. Second, Ms. Wolf. Please vote. <laughs> 